uh, because I'll review some of uh, <coughs> changes in labor force participation going clear back to 1992. And apropos of the last paper, you see that uh, men, this is labor force participation of men age 40 to 44, 45 to 49, and 50 to 54, uh, basically all have been declining uh, slowly or more, so, or maybe a even a little bit faster, especially uh, the age band 50 to 54 started out almost at 90 percent and then in 2012 had declined to about 84 percent. At the same time, at older ages, labor force participation has increased very substantially. Look at age uh, 65 to 69 has gone from 25 percent. Uh, to about 38%. So very different trends depending upon the part of the age distribution you're looking at. And I had wondered about uh, the older men, and I think uh, what you've done partially explains uh, some of that decline uh, among men who are in their uh, late 40s or, and early 50s. Uh, for women, uh, but that cannot be the same, expl uh, the, the total explanation, because we see for women at younger ages, more or less the same pattern, although uh, at earlier ages there was an increase until about the year 2000 and then a slow decline. Uh, for example, those age 45 to 49 declined from around 80 percent uh, down to around 75 percent, so a five percentage point decline in participation. But remarkably, the increase in participation at age 60 to 64, for example, 35 percent, clear up to 50 percent or 15 percentage points over that 20 years. Uh, very large changes. Um, and I also uh, wanted to point out, this is happening at really much older ages. Uh, men uh, 70 to 74 have gone from about 17% uh, up approaching 25% over those, uh, over, in this case, over 10 years. Uh, so large increases at older ages, uh, stable or even declining labor force participation rates at younger ages, both for men and women. The question we want to address is, will these increases at older ages uh, continue to, to uh, happen as we go forward? And uh, do we have any explanations for uh, these trends at older ages in uh, participation? So that's what we're going to do. Uh, brief outline, we're going to use the HRS. Uh, first, we'll look at trends in retirement hazards or uh, what we call labor force retention rates. That is the probability of staying in the labor force. Uh, we want to do this because we want to isolate retirement hazards, that is the probability of staying in once you're in, from changes in the incoming population we saw with declining labor force. Uh, the fraction of the population reaching their uh, 60s has been declining, so naturally you would, uh, if nothing else happened, you would see declining labor force participation at older ages, but we're seeing increasing, which means it's happening through changes in retirement hazards or possibly re-entry into the labor force. And we also want to look at the ages most affected. Our main tool for forecasting will be the subjective probability of working, which I'll explain and talk about. We want to look at trends in that and uh, the predictive validity of that measure, which uh, may not be familiar to everybody in this room. In fact, I'm sure it's not. Uh, we'll do some simulations of labor force participation uh, based on HRS uh, labor force transition rates, and then finally get predictions of future labor force participation based on these transitions plus the subjective probability of working. And then I'll present some data that, uh, f I guess, food for thought, uh, what could explain these things and what apparently cannot explain these things. So. Uh, first, starting out with uh, retention rates, these are the two-year labor force retention rates for men initially aged 60 to 64 in panel data. And so you read this, for example, that in 2002 in this age group, 78% uh, of those who were in the labor force in 2002 were in, also in the labor force in 2004. Uh, what you see from this, beginning in 1994, that retention rate was just 70% is a is a obvious upward trend in the retention rate uh, we get to uh, later years the probability of remaining in the labor force has gone up and uh, the slope of if you draw a line through these uh, points you, you get a slope of 0 0.002 which means that the retention rate over the 20 years from 1992 to 2010 has gone up by about 0.04 or four percentage points which 
is a non-trivial change in the retention rate. You think of changes in labor force participation of 4% as being something you would notice. <clears throat> For women, uh, here's a similar graph. And uh, here, the retention rate has gone up even more steeply. The slope of this is 0 0.003 or 0.06 or 6% over the 20 years, if you draw a line through that. Uh, summarize this uh, with uh, this graph, which shows these changes in retention rates, the slope of those, these are slopes that I just showed you. For example, this is for men, the 60 to 64 is the 0 0.002 that I just showed you. And this shows the increase in retention rates over 20 years on average for these different age bands. And you see for uh, the younger ages, basically no trend for men. 60 to 64, a large increase. 65 to 69, another increase. 70 to 74, a decrease. And 75 to 79, a very large increase. Of course, to get labor force participation, you, these are changes in the transition rates. You integrate these, and you can get fairly large changes in labor force participation from these trends. And for women, uh, they're larger. They're positive at all ages. And, uh, and larger in magnitude compared to men. And so the summary of this is mirroring what we saw in CPS data. We see an increase in HRS data, particularly among people in their sick, men and women in their 60s, in remaining in the labor force, uh, a decline in retirement hazards would be another way of saying that. Well, these are successive cross sections. Let's look uh, to see a little bit of the pattern in uh, panel data. So here are two birth cohorts just five years apart. They, and these show the retirement hazards as a function of age. And so, uh, for example, the cohort that was born in uh, 1941, because of sampling in the HRS, the 36 cohort is not observed until they're age 56. But uh, looking at the 1941 cohort, their uh, retirement hazard rate, the probability of leaving the labor force, was about 0.07 in, at age 51, an increase reaching a maximum in these data of about 27% uh, at age 67. The cohort that was born in 1936 looks pretty much the same, except for the years during the 60s. And there, the hazard rates are substantially higher. There's uh, at the same age, age, rate, uh, age ranges around uh, five percentage points higher uh, transition rates out of the labor force. And that just occurred in five years. So the 1936 cohort left the labor force uh, substantially more rapidly than the 1941 cohort, even though they're only separated by five years of uh, age. So that's the kind of thing that, uh, this is just an example, the kind of thing that we see in HRS data. So uh, I will, we will use the subjective probability of working uh, to help predict what's going to happen to future labor force participation. And this is the question that is asked of uh, workers in the HRS, thinking about work in general and not just your present job. What do you think are the chances you will be working full time after you reach age 62? We call that P62 in what I will present. And there's also a similar question where the target age is age 65 that we call P65. Uh, first, we'll look at the trends in the subjective probability of working to see what would be suggested uh, for prediction, and then we'll look at a few details of it. So this is for uh, P62, the subjective probability of working past age 62 for men. Uh, age, uh, let's take the, the first lowest, youngest, uh, age 55 to 56, beginning in 1992. So this is successive cross-sections looking at uh, successive two-year age bands as they come into the age range 55 to 56 in HRS. And we see in that age range a smallish increase from 53% to 58%. Other age bands are all trending up. Uh, others are more or less, but we see for men in any event uh, an increase in the subjective probability of working past age 62 over time controlling for age and uh, um, standardized, um, standardized uh, um, interview conditions from the HRS. For uh, P62 for women, a larger increase, uh, for example, the age band 55 to 56 increased from 42% to 
And uh, from, these, uh, from this, you would predict an increase in labor force participation at about age 62 of nine percentage points. These are, by, or you can think of these as Bernoulli probabilities, and so on average, uh, the outcomes, the uh, binary outcomes will average out to the stated probabilities if uh, these uh, are rational or, I should say, accurate forecasts of what will happen probabilistically. And we'll uh, see some evidence about that. P65 for men, uh, also increasing, but a much faster rate. You can see at 1992, around 30% was the uh, probability, uh, increasing to more than 40% in all the age bands, so an increase of at least 10 percentage points. And for women, even a much larger increase from 21% uh, to 40% in that uh, age band. 55 to uh, 56. So a summary of these is that the subjective probabilities over time of working past age 62 or past age 65 increased and in some cases increased very substantially. If they accurately predict what will happen to people, uh, then we would expect la future labor force participation to go up because after all, the 55 to 56 year olds are stating this in 2012, they will not be age 65 until 2023 and they're predicting what their participation will be uh, now, uh, nine years in, in, the, in the future. Well, one thing you would want to do is to look at the predictive accuracy of these things. And uh, so what this uh, does is take people who were uh, inducted into the HRS in 1992 um, and uh, stated their subjective probability and then we followed in panel and we see what their actual labor force participation is whenever they reached age 62 or 63. There's a little bit of ambiguity in the question whether we should be looking at age 62 or 63, which I'll gloss over, but that's been subject to some uh, attention. So the people who were born in 1992, they gave an average subjective probability of uh, a little bit less than 50%. Their participation rate, when they reached, when they were 62, was about the same. When they reached age 63, was slightly lower. Uh, 1998, more or less the same. The people who were inducted into the HRS in 2004, a little bit higher and you can see their actual labor force participation rates at age 62 and 63, very comparable. So at least at the population level, P62 predicted what, what the outcome actually was uh, very uh, reasonably closely, I would say. And if you look at individual levels of um, participation, you see the appropriate variation in actual outcomes uh, compared to their stated P62. Well, then our program is to simulate labor force participation uh, beginning with observed participation at younger ages, that is age, ages 51 through 55, using the HRS transition rates that we observe for these cohorts. So uh, we're going to simulate out their actual labor force participation uh, going from in the labor force to in the labor force, in the labor force to out of the labor force, out of the labor force, back into the labor force, using all of those transitions that we observe for this particular cohort over time and combining it at older ages with other cohorts. So we uh, have these simulate out to age 92, uh, <clears throat> beginning with uh, the initial conditions that I've talked about. So here's what happens when we do this. Uh, um, these are uh, centered at the average age, but they're actually done in at individual one-year age bands. And so age 53 is age 51 up through 55. And uh, this is their labor, average labor force participation compared to the CPS. And so the beginning participation, the beginning of the simulation is age 53. And you can see HRS and CPS are really the same which they should be because HRS is population representative. Uh, at age 58, that is uh, five years later, HRS is quite close to CPS. And this is, doesn't have to be this way. This just comes from these transitions, where CPS, of course, is a moment in time prevalence, cross-section prevalence. Age 63, similar. Age 68, similar. So uh, our conclusion from this is that observed transition rates in HRS, both into and out of the labor force and back into the labor force mimic what we see in cross-section in the CPS quite well. 
uh, integrating up those transitions to get prevalence. Okay, now we want to uh, ask what uh, the predictions would be if we were to modify the transition rates according to, uh, to reach the uh, stated uh, P62 that we see in data. So the issue is, uh, first we want to calibrate the transition rates so that we match P62 in the simulations when people are age 62, 63, and we use a Cox proportional hazard uh, model to do that. And it turns out when we do that, the Cox factor is only 0.98. That's a multiplic multiplicative factor. So the um, uh, average or the uh, modification to the transition rates is only 2%. And that's because we just saw the transition data fit pretty well to the P60 stated average P62. And uh, so then we will, after that, modify the Cox factor so that with a new stated P62, we can then simulate out what, what uh, labor force participation rate will be at ages uh, 62 and 63. And because the uh, P62 for later cohorts is, is higher, that means we have to reduce the cost, Cox factor, and you can see at the bottom of the screen, that reduces the retirement hazards by about 10%. And, uh, to match P62. So here's uh, summarizing uh, all of that that I just said. The bottom line, the red line, is HRS using P62 as stated in 1992. And the top line, the blue line, is HRS using the P62 as stated in 2010. So we have greater survival in the labor force in 2010 than we did in 1992 because stated uh, P62 is higher. And uh, if you were to look at age uh, 62, the difference between those two lines should be about uh, two, two and a half or three percent, whatever it was, the average P62. That's by construction. Uh, the largest difference between these two lines is at age 67. Uh, labor force participation is 3.4 percentage points higher under the blue line than under the uh, red line. And if you integrate under these curves, you get work life. Uh, so work life from age 53, and this includes people not in the labor force, it includes the whole population. Average work life uh, under the red line, under the P62 as stated in 1992, is 11.4 years, increased to 12.2 years. That increases about 7% of work life conditional on reaching age 53. So if we use P62, we get an increase in work life, uh, modest, I would say, uh, but an increase, about 7%. An alternative to P62 is P65. Uh, we see in CPS labor force participation larger increases in, in the middle to late 60s. And uh, so there's a, um, it may well be that if we want to uh, uh, capture better what is going to happen in the future. P65 may be a better uh, uh, number to, to, uh, to use. Uh, for example, P62 ages <coughs> 51 to 55 increased from 48.3% to 52.3% or 3.9 percentage points, whereas P65, the probability of working past age 65 increased from 26.5% to 36.9% over those 18 years, an increase of 10.4 percentage points, so a much larger increase. So people, there was a, a relatively modest change of working past age 62, but a much larger increase of working past age 65 as people thought about the future. So if we, uh, do, if we, if we use P65 and do the same calibrations as with P62, we get a much larger increase uh, here, the labor force participation rate increased by 8.2 percentage points at age 66. Work life increased from 10.4 to 12.3 years, uh, an increase of, of really of fairly 1.9 years, uh, conditional on reaching age 53. And this is, uh, again, for the whole population. So uh, what I would say uh, so far is that we have seen in the data, a big increase in uh, labor force retention rates, a decrease in, in uh, hazard rates, 
That translates, if it's, uh, particularly if we use age, uh, if we use P65, into a very fairly substantial increase in expected work life. What are the explanations for this uh, that one might uh, might bring forward? And I've listed a few here. I didn't list uh, veterans because I didn't know about that until a half hour ago. But uh, that should be added to the list here. But the ones you might think of and could enter models are things like health, survival, uh, joint retirement, the decline in DB plans. DB plans have strong incentives to take people out before age 62. And uh, so with the decline in those uh, switch to DC plans, that incentive is taken out. Uh, decline of physically demanding jobs and, of course, the increase in the normal retirement age in, so in Social Security. Uh, expectations of future Social Security benefit cuts. If you think your uh, future benefits may be cut, then maybe you better work longer, and a wealth explanation. So let's look at some indicators of these things and see where there might be some plausibility uh, here. This is uh, an informal data exploration. And so uh, better health makes work, um, work uh, less onerous. And what do we see here? And this is actually quite pertinent, again, to uh, the paper that we just looked at. So this is the percent of who rate their health as, as poor or fair in the HRS. Uh, <clears throat> and you can contrast what is happening at the younger ages, 51 to 56 and 57 to 61, with what's happening in the older population. So age 51 to 56, the percentage uh, went from about 17% uh, to substantially over 20%, about 23% uh, over, over these 18 years. So at least as far as self-rated health is concerned, it is not the case that the population is getting more healthy, is getting less healthy, at least at the draw-in ages of HRS, age 57 to 61, more or less flat. At the older ages, look at 80 to 84, people are getting more healthy as, as far as health, self-rated health is concerned. So a real twist in the health of the population by age. Percent with one or more ADL limitations on activities of daily living. Uh, uh, it's maybe an up, up uh, turn at age 51 to 56, but certainly a steady increase at 57 to 61, uh, flat and possibly declining at age 85 and above. Percent with diabetes, uh, very substantial increase at age 51 to 56, uh, in fact, at all age bands. Uh, so it may be that veterans had an increase in diabetes, but everyone else did too. Uh, and this is true for male or female. Uh, percent with BMI 30 and above, uh, again, the upward march uh, at all age bands, undoubtedly related to the diabetes uh, uh, onsets that we've seen. So the conclusion that you see, and it, I, we looked at, uh, at other uh, conditions, and basically the store is the same. There is no evidence, in fact, I would say there is evidence that the incoming population reaching retirement age is actually getting less healthy rather than more healthy, which is uh, shocking, I would say. What about survival? HRS asks, um, what are the chances you will live to 75, uh, subjective survival? These are predictive of actual mortality outcomes and have been studied uh, a lot. People can tell you about these things. This is for men. And uh, what you see is age uh, 60 to 64, more or less flat until uh, 2008, and then a declining subjective probability. Age 55 to 59, overall a declining subjective probability. So people are becoming more pessimistic about their chances of survival in keeping with or in, uh, in concordance with uh, their objective health status. Uh, females, an increase until about 2002, and then I would characterize that as a decline also. Um, again, I think this is rather shocking that, uh, that you know, so the long upward tra trend in health in the United States may be coming to an end. A joint retirement uh, with the increased participation of women, uh, there's been, this has been studied rather substantially. Uh, maybe men want to stay in the labor force longer. 
<coughs> about what caused the labor force uh, increase in labor force participation of wives. Decline in DB pensions, uh, strong incentives to retire. <coughs> These are the fraction of workers with DB pensions on the current job um, age, I believe it's age 51 to 56, and you see indeed for men a decline from around 27% down uh, in below uh, 20. Uh, for women, uh, somewhat of a decline, although it's less obvious. So that could, that's a partial explanation, and Suzanne and I actually have a paper where we look at this and we, we think it explains maybe a third of the um, increase in, uh, in uh, participation. Physically demanding jobs, I uh, just point, put that up. We don't have any data on that, so I'll, we haven't done anything on that. Changes in the Social Security system, of course, increasing the retirement age from 65 to 66 has had an impact uh, from other work, uh, but of course the trend began before that happened, and so there are other uh, reasons, or there must be some other explanations. Expectations about future Social Security generosity. We ask people, what, what is your subjective probability? What, what are the chances that Social Security will be modified to make it less generous over the, in the future? And you can see these average subjective probabilities have increased over time, 60% uh, up to uh, somewhat over 70%, and a reaction to that might be to work longer. And uh, then finally, wealth. Here's the household wealth of couples uh, reaching a maximum in 2006, uh, then 2008 with the declining house prices, which for most people is more important than stock ownership. And uh, what was surprising to me was to look at the continued decline into 2012, both at the mean and the median. Uh, part of the explanation for that is we've seen a very large downward trend in the holdings of stocks outside of retirement accounts among ordinary people. So they locked in their losses after the Great Recession by selling out and, and uh, staying out. Uh, the median wealth, 300000 down to 200000 is this is in real terms, is I think uh, extremely surprising and uh, almost shocking. Uh, single persons, uh, a lot more variance, uh, much smaller samples, but you see uh, basically the same story, I would say, there. So, in summary, uh, large changes in the subjective probability of working, especially past age 65. If we use P65 to forecast labor force participation in 2023, of those who were 51 to 55 in uh, 2010, we see that participation will be 8.2 uh, percentage points higher when they reach age 66 than those who were age 51 to 55 in 1992 when they reached age 66 in 2005. So a pretty big upward shift in participation based on this. And here's kind of a summary of that. Uh, the uh, participation rates from simulations at age 60 to 64 and 65 to 69 uh, between 2006 and 2023 uh, predicted to increase by 7.1% in the one case percentage points and 8.1 percentage points in the others. Here are some CPS for those same age bands. Uh, we're partly there, but uh, certainly not all, the, uh, certainly not all uh, completely there. And I'll stop there. Understanding how and why labor force participation is changing in the U.S. has to be one of the most important and consequential questions for, for the American economy. Uh, I'm a labor economist, so I tend to focus on the trends for the working age group. And uh, the changes have not been pretty, uh, as part of the discussion earlier suggested, uh, especially for men, especially for unskilled men especially for unskilled men in some parts of the country like the Midwest. 
uh, the U.S. traditionally had a high participation rate relative to European countries. If you look at unskilled men in the Midwest, they're working less than Italians or Greek or French workers um, in the same age range. Um, and the trend is, is particularly uh, worrisome when you look at the change between 2007, 2008, and today for, for that group. On the other hand, at the other extreme of the age distribution, we just learned that uh, things are looking good for, for older individuals, especially those above uh, 55, and especially for those above 60 and, 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 um, and for later ages. Um, so the trends are complex, uh, I think are very well documented. Um, the two key questions are what's driving these trends and what can we expect in the next, say, 5, 10, 20 years. Um, and this is, what, this is where, uh, especially the prediction part of, the, of, this, of, this, of these questions, this is where this paper uh, uh, is, is focused on. Um, there are obvious and important reasons why this question is of paramount importance. Uh, first of all, it's clearly important for uh, the future of federal finances. Uh, uh, obviously, if younger men are increasingly checking out of the labor force and going into programs like the one that Mark has talked about uh, in today's presentation and his previous work, that's a really troublesome sign for, for, uh, for public finances, for US public finances. On the other hand, if people tend to work longer at the end of their uh, working age uh, and they tend to uh, make more money than in the past, that actually goes in the other direction. And understanding exactly what we can expect, <coughs> what we can expect on net when the current young people become older, it's obviously of great importance for if you're trying to, for example, think about what should we do about social security, how much should we cut or how much should we increase revenue, things like that. Um, it's also a question that has an enormous importance for, for understanding the labor market. Uh, if labor supply is shrinking, among the young and increasing among the old, that has enormous implications for the wages, for the equilibrium wages that we're going to observe. We already know that the inequality has increased, uh, but if the young, unskilled male workers are leaving massively the labor force, the actual inequality, that the underlying inequality, uh, once you account for this uh, selection away, for this supply effect, uh, is actually even larger. Uh, these people are, are, are leaving uh, presumably because uh, the wages that they, they, they can fetch are, are low. Uh, they would be even lower if there were million and million uh, like them in the labor market uh, competing for the same, for a given labor demand. These questions are enormously important for the macro economy, of course. Uh, if labor supply shrinks among the young people, um, that obviously is not good news for, for, uh, for GDP. Uh, and for, 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 for economic growth. On the other hand, if labor supply increases among the elderly, that could at least in part offset that, that, that decline. Um, and then of course, understanding labor force participation is crucially important, at least in the short run, for monetary policy. Uh, this is all the Fed is, is thinking about these days. Uh, unemployment has, has gone down, likely. We're now around 6%. It's half of what it used to be less, uh, almost half what it used to be. But wages haven't increased just yet. Um, so one explanation for this apparent contradiction could be that labor force participation had collapsed so much among certain type of workers in certain type of regions of the country that, um, that there's a lot of slack in the, in, the, uh, in the labor market that is not reflected in the unemployment rate because the unemployment rate, of course, is conditional on being in the labor force. So understanding how labor force participation is about to change in the short run, in the next say, year or two, is crucially important for the people at the Fed who are trying to say, who are trying to decide should we raise or not raise interest rates? Should we reduce or not reduce uh, money supply? Because really what people are gonna do, whether the people who have left the labor force participation, especially the young, if they're coming back into the labor market, then that, that there's, there's much more room to grow in terms of, uh, they can be much more patient. Uh, if on the other hand these people are gone, they're never gonna come back, maybe because they're captured by one of these absorbing state, like, like Mark's programs. Um, 
then they're gone. They're not going to come back, and at some point, pretty soon, wages will start rising. Okay, so understanding labor force participation changes at the young, at, 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 for the young and for the elderly is crucially important. Um, this paper focuses on predicting future labor force participation. And its main innovation is to use a new question, or a question that other people haven't used uh, for, for this goal, uh, on the probability that the respondent uh, will work in the future. So this is a self-reported self probability that that person who is responding uh, in the HRS is, is, is the probability that that person um, uh, claims they're going to work they're going to work in the future the paper essentially is made of two parts step one the paper seeks to convince us that these probabilities are a good predictor and so basically they use this probability to try to predict the past and see whether the good they do a good job uh, they compare past uh, labor force participation trends uh, in the HRS uh, with trends that one could have predicted with this self-reported uh, or uh, self-reported probabilities. And that's step two. So the first step is looking backward. The second step is looking forward. They say, well, I convinced you that they're, they're, they're good. They, they match fairly well, the CPS and the HRS. In the past, what can we expect for the next, for the next 10 years? The key findings are two. First of all, uh, these this, uh, this self-reported probabilities uh, of working past 62 predict fairly well the actual observed increase that we see over the past 15 years uh, for, the, for, for, for those old age. And two, and most importantly, for their paper, um, the self-reported probability of future labor force participation uh, continue to increase among workers uh, even as early as their, their 50s. Um, so this, obviously, it's an important, if true, this is an important piece of information for this, this debate that, that, that I was just uh, highlighting before on the future of labor force participation. Um, the, in particular, the authors predict that labor force participation rate of older workers will continue to increase in the future for the next 10 years. My first suggestion or, or question is to try to motivate a little bit better the use of this subjective probability. Um, is, I mean, if I look at their figure one labor force participation rates, they move, they're pretty smooth trends. These are demographic trends. These are like lines. So it's not, in theory, it's not all that hard to predict those trends looking at the past. More in general, we have a long tradition in economics of trying to predict the future, conditioning on what we observe today. Uh, so, for example, we could try to predict labor force participation next year, conditioning on labor force participation today, last year, two years ago, and so on. You can even make it richer and include a lot of observable features of the economy, not just the outcome that you're trying to predict, but some axes that are, that are potential shifter of, uh, say, labor demand and labor supply, anything from interest rate to GDP to... You're trying to predict. So, just throw in everything you got it cannot make you make your prediction worse. Um, so the key question is, like the first question, the first suggestion is, is to try to compare this self-reported probability with the standard approach that economists would have, which is throwing the kitchen sink and, and see what, what, what type of prediction you get. And so, and I would argue that when you're trying to do this horse race, you care about two things. You care about the first moment, you care about getting the, the average, you, you care about getting labor force participation right on average, but also you care about pre uh, precision of, of the prediction. So you also care about the, the second moment. Um, and also, I mean, you can either look at them separately or just have some type of loss function, but irrespective of how you actually do it, I mean, the answer could be different uh, depending on whether you are, uh, the answer of which one is better. Is your question better or is the standard approach better? Could be different whether we are looking at, at, at mean or, or, or variance. More in general, it, the two approaches don't need to be substitute. They actually probably complement. Uh, so in principle, one could use them both to try to predict. In fact, one should use them both to try to predict um, and see whether that improves your prediction of the past uh, 
trends as, as measured in the CPS or, or, or in the HRS. Um, I would suggest a rich model, and you can even potentially interact. Uh, your question, uh, the answer to your subjective probability, um, with the Y, the, you know, the lag Ys and the lag Xs that, that, that are available, uh, and see whether that, that um, first of all, does that increase predictive power, and second, does that uh, get you more precise, more precise estimates? Um, one issue that um, I was thinking about, and this is suggestion number three, is how sensitive are the subjective probabilities to uh, idiosyncratic shocks or systematic shocks that the respondent is, is experiencing. Uh, we know that the standard way of predicting, almost by constructor, is going to give you smooth trends. So if I'm trying to predict labor force participation next year based on the previous uh, vector of labor force participation this year and the previous 10 years, given that the previous trends is smooth, I'm going to have a smooth prediction. Question is, when you add your subjective probability, how do people overreact? For example, um, you know, if I wonder whether you know, if you ask people how long whether they're going to work um, um, in, in in five years, and you ask them in 2007, but then you ask them in 2008 when the stock market has just collapsed, the stock market has lost say like half, half the, the, the retirement say the, the retirement. Uh, Nestag is gone, you know, half of it is gone because the stock market is gone. Do they overreact uh, relative to what they actually end up doing later? Or do they, are, are they actually able to filter that out, to realize, okay, well, the stock market is down, but it could be up in like in five years, so maybe when I'm trying to predict my future labor force participation, I'm going to discount, uh, to some extent, the, the, the news of the day. Okay. Or it could be that they overact to personal uh, events. Like, uh, you know, you ask them after they were just fired from their job, they might overreact. Again, they might say, well, I'm going to be retired in five years. Well, in fact, so they might, they might not discount the fact that they, they, they eventually they're going to find another job if they want to. So. Um, that's the second reason why, if this is the case, then combining subjective probabilities with the standard approach of using the, the, the lag Ys and the lag axis uh, could actually improve both fit and, and precision. So in, in the end, really, one question is why are we using uh, subjective probabilities in the first place? Are we trying to predict the long run or are we trying to predict the short run? Um, you're, in your paper, you're trying to predict the long run. These are mostly smooth trends. Um, that they, they matter for fiscal policy. For example, as I was arguing before, they matter if we're thinking about social security, reform of social, the social security system. Um, maybe the subjective probability are a better fit for predicting short, short, uh, short run trends. Because the smooth trends that you get from uh, AR models, they might ignore the information that comes available in real time to individual, at least if they don't overreact. So it might be that there is, there is a market or there is a demand for short-term predictions um, of labor force participation and that the, the subjective probabilities might be a, a, a better fit, especially when there's a lot of idiosyncratic shocks that are, that are coming to, the mar to, 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 uh, to life and they're not yet reflected in the, in the axis and the Ys. And then the fifth suggestion is that this is, seems to be a very rich uh, new source of information. And I think that it can be used not just to predict, but also to better understand individual behavior. Uh, I, so one example was to see whether people overact or not in their, in their expectation. An even more important uh, example would be to look at whether there are groups of people who make systematic mistakes in their predictions. Uh, and I'm thinking about especially the difference between high skill workers or high skill individual and, and, and less, less skill individual. Like comparing the ac accuracy of prediction of college graduates with the accuracy of predictions of high school graduates in high school dropouts. And uh, you can also do it by race or by region of the country. And then one, you know, one obvious question is 
are people who overpredict or underpredict their future labor force participation, um, do they also have the wrong saving rate? Do they, for example, undersave or oversave? For example, do the group who underpredict their future labor supply do they do they um, do they oversave or do, do they undersave? Uh, so, are there actual consequences from from this systematic mistake? And uh, um, and is there something to be to be done about about helping people predict uh, pre predict the future uh, by giving them not just information about the personal circumstances, but possibly maybe the information about again the whys and the access. Um, and the last suggestion is, is more, so these are all like methodological uh, comments. The substantive comment uh, is that um, I find it very surprising. Um, I have no reason to doubt it, but I find it surprising. I learned something I didn't know, uh, that, uh, that labor force participation is increasing or is expected to increase even for the young group. Now, this is the young group within the old group. So we're, we're talking about HRS. So I think the young group is 55, 50 to 55. But for that young group, um, there's an expected increase in labor force participation. And, um, and this is jarring, um, or it's surprisingly, uh, in, especially in the context of what we've seen actually happening for the, young, the younger group, the, 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 the prime age male group, uh, especially for the high school dropout and high school graduate who have been dropping from the labor force starting 2008 in large numbers, especially in Rust Belt, mid Midwestern states. Um, and, 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 they, and their labor force participation doesn't, hasn't really recovered at all, uh, not even, not even in, in, in 2013 or 2014. So what I would like to see is a more disaggregated analysis that one focuses on, on this young group or the youngest group you can you can do this for, but two focuses on the less skilled of, of the, the least skilled of, of this group, the, the high school dropout and high school graduates, um, especially in Midwestern state, and see are they still are, are, even for that group what are they expecting, and uh, and if they're still if that result holds for that for that subpopulation, um, then the, the then the contrast between the actual trends and the, and, and the future expectation it's even more. It's even more uh, re remarkable and needs to be investigated. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks very much for your uh, really good comments. Uh, and uh, I think we'll um, try to work on some of those. Let me uh, first correct uh, something I guess was not clear in the paper. We predict increasing labor force participation of um, people who are in their mid to late 60s by uh, 20, uh, 2023 compared to what it is today, we make no prediction about participation among those who are in their early 50s. This is all conditional on reaching the labor force uh, by people who are in their 50s. We don't uh, have any predictions about what's going to happen to 51 to 55 year olds in 2023. So that's the first thing. The second is the while the conventional model uh, predicts things smoothly, it certainly would not have predicted the upturn in participation by people in their 60s that began in 1990. Participation had been declining, and any kind of past trend analysis would suggest con continuing declining. But P62 did predict that in 1992 because P62 predicted what labor force participation would be among those people in 1992 who were in their early 50s when they reached age uh, 65 and 62. We saw that in one of those graphs. So the P62 and P65 did correctly predict the upturn, whereas an uh, uh, autoregressive model would not have. So, but I think it's a good idea to consider combining uh, data uh, in other ways. Uh, at the individual, the other reason and another reason to use uh, subjective probabilities is you get a fine-grained heterogeneity. Uh, we can look at uh, how these vary by education level, by any per, any characteristic that you can observe in the data, or even by not by a characteristic, just purely at the individual level. So you can get at fine-grained heterogeneity that you cannot get at in uh, any kind of model. 
And it turns out that these things vary by characteristics in, a, in the way you would think. For example, people who have a DB pension where the age for full benefits is at age 61 give low probabilities of working past age 62. People who have a DB benefit that kicks in at age 63 have a high probability of working past age 62. These kinds of things you can see uh, in subjective probabilities. But the, the real th strength is they collapse the time dimension. To find out what's going to hap happen to participation in, 19 uh, in 2023, you have to wait until then. But this collapses the time dimension uh, really in an interesting manner. OK. Yeah, let's take some questions. So, so I have a question. I, I am working at the Fed, and as Enrico uh, indicated, we're keenly interested in this. And one of the things I'm interested in is whether you can tease out in your data the extent to which, I was thinking about it this way, the extent to which people have um, some independent trend, and they mean revert back to that, versus cross-sectional shocks put you on a different level altogether. And so I guess, I was trying to think of how you could do that, but one way you might be able to do it is see if the, uh, if there's, if the, what group you belong to is a better predictor of your labor force participation in your data than uh, which shock you experienced. So do people who are low education, do they have a different trend than people who are higher education? Or do people sort of all respond together when you get a big shock like the financial crisis or some other kind of a shock? Well, these kinds of uh, heterogeneity issues, of course, are extremely interesting. And uh, one thing that I had anticipated is that the change in participation with the declining health might be due to a heterogeneity, but if you look at the fraction of the population that reports their health to be very good or excellent, that's also been declining. It's not like the distribution has been going into two parts. Uh, so it's a further puzzlement. The um, Great Recession shock, uh, we've looked at that somewhat, and you definitely see a change in uh, participation. There may be an overreaction there, but it's really hard to know. You know, the, you take people out of the labor force uh, at that age, often they don't come back in. So the unemployment shock uh, for most people is, was probably a more important thing. We have a couple questions at this end. Uh, thank you, Michael, for a very interesting presentation. And I agree that your health data are indeed shocking, as you said several times, with a percentage of with self-described poor and fair health up, uh, pessimism about survival up. Um, and this contradicts the conventional wisdom, I think. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on why, what's going on? Why is this happening? And to what extent is this uh, obesity finally showing up? It would be consistent with your diabetes data. And some people think obesity is what's eventually going to turn increases in longevity around, and these will start declining. Is that what's going on, or what is? Uh, your, you. What I can, what I can say, I, I uh, go to a lot of uh, talks and conferences about these kinds of topics, but of course I'm not an uh, expert on, on the, even though my initials are MD, that does not mean I'm a medical doctor. Uh, I think there is uh, controversy about this, and one reason there's controversy is because the um, diabetes is reaching into a much deeper part of the population than it did before, so the consequences of type 2 diabetes on people will be difficult on average to infer from what, went, what happened before. Also the length of exposure has declined because people are, uh, the length of exposure has declined for some people, will be much longer for others. Uh, so I think there's difference of opinion. Uh, someone like Jay Orshansky would say that our, popu that our population health has reached its maximum and is going to start to decline, whereas uh, James Wolpel would say the opposite. So I don't really have an, the experts are in disagreement, so I uh, really don't have anything to say about that. Um, <clears throat> I agree that uh, you're finding that there's genuine predictive power in people's forecasts about what they will be doing after 62 when they're in their earlier mid-50s. It, it's a very important finding. It might suggest that the government would be very well advised to actually have bigger surveys asking people to make this, these kinds of predictions. Uh, I wonder whether we can see whether there are predictions, 
would be further improved if you take account of the shocks that occur between the time they make them and the time you're later measuring their participation because obviously a terrible shock like the 2008-2009 recession should affect whether or not their predictions turn out to be true. But the, the other point I wanted to make has to do with the comment both I, I, I heard both the speakers make, which has to do with the effect of these developments on GDP. Those must depend very crucially on uh, who it is who is leaving the workforce under 55 and who is remaining in after 62, number one. And, and as I said before, I think the biggest decline in participation, the thing that having an outsized effect is the big drop that has occurred under age 25. And so what is the population doing that's under 25 that might substitute for uh, labor market experience? I mean, they could be staying in school longer and actually boosting their productivity, or they could be playing Xbox in their parents' basements. So it, it makes a great deal of difference. Uh, Mark Doug Duggan can tell us about what is, who the people are who are uh, dropping out under age 55. My research and other people's research suggests that the people staying in after 62 are actually uh, non-randomly selected from among the most productive people. So those are the ones staying in, and so the, you know, th there might be a more than uh, proportional increase in the output of those people. And for the people under 55, if they're low expected productivity people, uh, there's going to be a smaller impact on GDP than there would be if it, they're just drawn at random from the productivity distribution. Was there a question there or? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe there might be here. Laura, right. Yeah, I do have a question. Are, are there items in HRS that would allow you to separate um, the desire to work longer from the expectation of opportunity to work longer. Uh, even a DB plan gives a strong signal to uh, a, a worker that it's time to exit. And so some of this is even social norms, but I mean, it, they're, they're, they're two very different factors to that, I would say. Right, and uh, I haven't looked at those data for a while, uh, but early on I did, and we asked uh, workers uh, how they would quote how they would like to retire and you know so all at once gradually decrease all this other kind of thing most workers say they would like to gradually decrease in fact that's not what happens to most workers they're uh, all all in to all out and I think the reason for that is they don't understand the constraints um, and but in a separate in 1992 Bob and I designed uh, so a few questions to ask workers about the, their ability to work part So many workers want to work part-time or part, part week. Uh, but when we ask these uh, opportunities in the form of subjective probabilities, what are the chances you could get a job that would allow you to work four days a week at your same wage rate? We found that people were actually fairly realistic when it came to describing the environment, but they had not integrated that well into their desires about their actual retirement. So in a nutshell, people state they would like to retire in a certain way, but many, in fact, do not retire in that way. Uh, Mike, have the last word. Mike uh, what's been happening to the age-specific mortality rates uh, at those ages where you observe uh, declining health? Uh, you may remember from David Wise last year at this conference, those age-specific mortality rates have been declining very substantially, even as self-rated health has worsened. So how do you reconcile those two things? Uh, the, uh, I, could give you, I could give you an answer that I don't especially believe. Uh, uh, right. Self-rated self -rated health is a moment-in-time statement about your health. Survival is a statement about what is going to happen to your health integrated over a lot of future years. No, Let's no, I'm talking about age-specific rates. They're dying in those years. What rate are they dying? Uh, those rates have improved at yeah. the same time these self-rated health uh, variables It's the self-rated health that's a future prediction. Is that it? No. no. Health should be a moment in time. A moment well, the, in de time. the death rate is a moment in time, too. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree with that. I'm, I was thinking more of the subjective uh, survival probabilities, which integrate. No, but I'm from, not. I'm telling you age specific. Well, I, uh, 
that, that is a puzzle. But that's outside of our uh, uh, survey. Um, maybe somebody else has an answer to that. I mean, do you think that, Mark? Self-rated health is certainly a strong predictor of mortality at the individual level. So do you think that it is plausible that the threshold for what's fair and what's poor health may change as a function of economic circumstances? It's interesting to me, this research on Medicaid recently, for example, has found you can't, it's hard to find effects on objective measures of health and yet self-reported health has improved somewhat. So to what extent might it be interacting with a person's economic conditions? I mean, Bound and Wademan had this research suggesting that the fraction reporting, if I'm remembering it correctly, the fraction reporting that they, uh, their health wasn't great was a function varied with economic conditions. A fair well, I think there's, there's a little, there's some of that. It's called differential item functioning, which has been the subject of a lot of research by beginning by Gary King, and uh, they use vignettes to try to sort this out. That could possibly be a little bit of, of what's going on, but if you look at some of the objective health measures, the, uh, which I didn't show, the heart, having had heart disease, having had a cancer, uh, the diabetes and so on, I mean, it's very clear what the trend is from those also, and it's basically in, in synchronization with self-rated health, and of course I gave you these numbers over 18 years, or the same would be over 20 years, and so the ups and downs are in there, but uh, cer certainly people respond partly to affect when answering these questions. That's known from survey design where you randomize the questions about self-rated health before or after you've asked people, has a doctor ever told you you've had a heart attack, and you get different distributions according to that. You remind people, yeah, a doctor did tell you at one time you'd had a cancer, and, and uh, so then you self-rate your health worse. But these are uh, positioned in the same place in the HRS. It's a, a standardized interviews, and so there may be some cyclical effects, but I think the long-term trends are in sync with the other things that we see. Why it hasn't been reflected yet in mortality, Victor, I don't know. The, the self-reported conditions, health conditions, are partly a function of a diagnosis, not of any real change. But with diabetes, about a third of it is undiagnosed, and that may have changed over time, for example. Just one. Just well, I mean, yeah, change it. But, you know, we, you, you, you go to, the, well, it's, 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 there, are many, there are a lot of physical indicators that are there that are not subject to diagnosis. Okay, thank you very much.